next one is segment 30 warehousing under customs this is the last chapter in customs concentrate imported goods can be deposited in warehouse without payment of customs duty correct and whether these warehouses are owned by the customs department or licensed by the customs department these are licensed by the customs department and warehouses are mainly three types of warehouses public warehouse private warehouse and special warehouse public warehouse means goods belonging to any person can be deposited but in private warehouse goods belonging to that warehouse keeper only can be deposited for example i have a private warehouse then goods belonging to me only can be deposited in that warehouse whereas if it is a public warehouse goods belonging to me or goods belonging to any person can be deposited into that warehouse but in case of special warehouse only notified goods can be deposited in special warehouse and then if warehouse license is cancelled they can cancel the license of the warehouse on account of breach of condition from the license holder then the goods deposited in the warehouse should be transferred to another warehouse or cleared for home consumption within seven days from the date of cancellation order so suppose if we deposited goods in one warehouse and the warehouse license is cancelled within seven days either you clear it for home consumption or you transfer it to another warehouse and whenever we deposit the goods in warehouse we need to execute a warehousing bond that warehousing bond is of two types consignment bond and general bond if it is a consignment bond three times the duty payable we need to execute the bond if it is a general bond as specified by the officer we need to execute that bond upon execution of bond and upon filing bill of entry for warehousing or into bond bill of entry the customs officer will pass a warehousing order and what is the period for which we can deposit the goods in warehouse without payment of customs duty for a period of one year from the warehousing order remember that for a period of one year from the date of warehousing order we can deposit the goods and this one year can be reduced by the proper officer by considering the nature of the goods and this one year time limit is not applicable in case of EOU, EHTP, STP and warehouse where manufacturing operations are permitted. So, for a period of one year, we can deposit the goods in warehouse, but there is an interest free period. What is the period for which we need to pay interest? Because of depositing the goods in warehouse, you are deferring the customs duty payable. So, therefore, you have to pay interest. What is the interest free period? 90 days. So, interest will be payable from 91st day after the date of warehousing order. Overall, one year you can keep the goods in warehouse, but in that one year, 90 days will be interest free period and beyond that you need to pay interest. What is the rate of interest? 15% per annum. Then, we can do manufacturing and other operations in the warehouse. That is, we import the goods, raw material and we can process the finished goods where in warehouse and we can export that finished goods we don't have to pay customs duty on the raw material again i am repeating we are importing raw material we are keeping the raw material in the warehouse and we are processing the raw material into finished goods thereafter the finished goods are exported now imported goods not cleared for home consumption kept in warehouse from there it is exported we don't have to pay customs duty on the raw material now during this manufacturing process some waste and scrap will be generated on that waste and scrap either you destroy the waste and scrap or you sell it in India that is clear it from warehouse if you are clearing that waste and scrap from warehouse you need to pay customs duty only on that waste and scrap read that manufacturing and other operations are permitted in the warehouse and duty not payable on that warehouse goods if processed goods are exported <coughs> however customs duty payable on the waste and scrap at the rate applicable to waste and scrap arising out of manufacture if that waste and scrap is not destroyed within the warehouse got the clarity then in case of volatile goods customs duty not payable on the quantity lost on account of evaporation or other natural causes for example we imported uh, whiskey okay we imported whiskey in one barrel and that whiskey usually we will not import it in uh, bottles and all any any whiskey for that matter let it be old monk or antiquity or jack daniels these brands and all are international brands 
how you know sir general knowledge only here okay so i don't have any experience in that and all so but uh, i know the brands i mean brands i am telling so we are importing that not in bottles so we will import it in barrels so that barrels when we are importing so we keep it in the warehouse and thereafter we will convert it into the bottles and then it will be sold in india but when it is imported and kept in the barrels what will happen <coughs> on account of excess heat so whiskey is also having the evaporation property so therefore it will get evaporated when it gets evaporated we imported 10000 liters but at the time of clearance from the warehouse only 9500 liters are there so what happened to 50 liters natural causes evaporated now we need to pay customs duty on 10000 liters or 9500 liters only on 9500 liters in case of volatile goods customs duty not payable on the quantity lost on account of evaporation or other natural causes then see this so whenever we are importing the goods that imported goods may be deposited in a public warehouse or may be deposited in a private warehouse or may be deposited in a special warehouse so this public warehouse what goods can be deposited goods belonging to any person private warehouse goods belonging to license holder special warehouse notified goods belonging to any person this public warehouse private warehouse and special warehouse all three warehouses are licensed by the principal commissioner or commissioner and this public warehouse and private warehouse will be under records based control whereas this special warehouse will be under physical control so any imported goods in port or airport first for a period of 30 days it will be under the control of a custodian and within that 30 days we need to file bill of entry for warehousing or into bond bill of entry and we need to clear the goods to the warehouse without payment of customs duty but we need to execute a bond now after the date when we deposited the goods in the warehouse so can we do manufacturing and other operations in the warehouse yes and for what period we can deposit the goods in warehouse in case of eou ehtp stp or private warehouse no time limit but in case of others one year from the date of warehousing order interest free period so in case of this no interest eou ehtp stp but for others what is the interest free period 90 days from the date of warehousing order now from the warehouse where we can clear either we can clear it to another warehouse or we can clear it to importer's place or we can export it from the warehouse suppose from one warehouse to another warehouse if we are clearing so whether customs duty payable or not payable not payable because we are not clearing it for home consumption still the goods are in the warehouse only so no bill of entry but a transfer request to be made and customs duty not payable whatever bond that we have executed that will be retained suppose if the goods are cleared for home consumption by the importer they need to file one bill of entry <coughs> what is it bill of entry ex bond bill of entry for home consumption and upon payment of customs duty the bond will be released and there is one case law here kesoram rayan case and sbc sugars case so this kesoram rayan case and sbc sugars case of supreme court says that goods deemed to be improperly cleared upon expiry of warehousing period we imported the goods we deposited the goods in warehouse what is the period for which we can deposit the goods in warehouse one year so now one year or any time prescribed by the officer now the time limit is over when the time limit is over still you are keeping the goods the goods are deemed to be improperly cleared from the warehouse upon expiry of the warehousing period that is this two cases kesoram rayan case and sbc sugars case goods deemed to be improperly cleared on expiry of warehousing period then suppose if the imported goods which are kept in warehouse is exported whether we need to file any bill of entry no but shipping bill needs to be filed for export whether we need to pay customs duty no customs duty not payable by because first of all goods did not cross the customs barrier so therefore bond will be released then when the goods are in the warehouse what are the rights of the importer so they can inspect the goods they can check the goods they can sort the goods and they can show them for sale but they need to exercise caution to prevent loss or deterioration and damage why because 
if the goods which are deposited in the warehouse if the value of the goods come down damage happens then we will not pay full customs duty we will pay abatement so we will pay abated customs duty that's the reason why we need to exercise the care and caution with respect to that warehoused goods so this is about warehousing provisions that we have then next one foreign trade policy the last segment so customs we have completed and uh, so whatever we have discussed in this so from valuation and type of customs duty one question guaranteed valuation and type of customs duty one question guaranteed and the weightage will be of like uh, around 5 to 6 marks 5 to 6 marks sometimes we get a question from valuation also type of customs duty also worst come only i am telling you like one question from these two chapters so that weightage from these two chapters <coughs> including mcq is 8 marks including mcq is 8 marks then that is descriptive question will be 5 or 6 marks mcq some 2 marks we will get so 8 marks is the weightage of these two chapters which two chapters types of customs duty and valuation under customs then duty drawback and baggage from duty drawback and baggage any one question is guaranteed so that will be again for 4 to 5 marks 4 to 5 marks this they are following for every attempt every attempt they are following and then exemptions every attempt they are asking one question for 4 marks so therefore these 6 chapters itself will give you 15 marks out of 20 marks 6 chapters what are they valuation types of customs duty duty drawback baggage and exemptions this five chapters so itself will give you 50 marks ftp guaranteed four to five marks so therefore these six chapters alone if you read also you will be getting 20 out of 25 guaranteed then remaining chapters introduction to customs classification procedures assessment and audit warehousing etc and all if you read you will get five marks okay so therefore I just gave you the importance which chapters you need to focus more then foreign trade policy so this FTP actually May 23 will be the last attempt for this FTP because November 23 there is a new foreign trade policy that is coming up because from April 1st onwards already they released a new foreign trade policy so therefore doubtful only for November 23 exam this old foreign trade policy now what is this foreign trade policy first of all we need to regulate the imports and encourage the exports why we need to regulate imports because imports will create a deficit balance of payments position so because of which the rupee will depreciate and the foreign currency will appreciate so therefore we need to regulate imp imports because imports lead to foreign exchange outflow then we need to encourage exports why we need to encourage exports because exports leads to inflow of foreign exchange but exports are actually not dutiable but imports are dutiable under customs so customs department <coughs> will encourage imports and discourage exports because they are concerned about revenue so due to that reason this foreign trade regulating the foreign trade is taken from customs and given to ministry of commerce and industry so therefore the applicable ministry for this FTP foreign trade policy is not customs department or finance ministry it will be ministry of commerce and industry now what is the job of this ministry of commerce and industry they need to regulate imports and encourage exports accordingly one act has been enacted that is foreign trade regulation and development act 1992 and this foreign trade regulation and development act 1992 delegated the powers to ministry of commerce and industry that ministry of commerce and industry in turn delegated the powers to dgft direct trade general of foreign trade like how cbdt is for direct tax <coughs> cbic is for indirect taxes for foreign trade we have dgft DGFT through their regional authorities from time to time will be giving a policy for the purpose of regulating imports and encouraging exports that policy is called as foreign trade policy 
So, foreign trade policy regulates, develops and promotes international trade. So, this foreign trade policy is actually a 5 year policy with annual updation and the difference between customs act and foreign trade policy is that foreign trade policy is the brain of international trade, what to import, what to export. Whereas, the body of the international trade that is how to import, how to export, what customs duty payable that is contained in customs act contains procedure, valuation and consequences. The current FTP is up to 2015-2023. So, therefore, up to 31st March 2023, they extended the current FTP. So, up to 31st March 2023. So, actually it was expired by 2020, but they extended for a further period of 3 years. And the contents of foreign trade policy are basic policy plus export incentives. That alone we have in syllabus. But this handbook of procedures, <coughs> ayat niryat forms, standard input output norms, harmonized system of coding, these are all not there. But these are all there in FTP. But what we have for CA final exam is only basic policy plus export incentives. So, what does the basic policy says? Under FTP, imports are classified into broadly four. That is prohibited, then restricted, freely importable and reserved for state trading enterprises. Prohibited means those goods cannot be imported. For example, these goods made up of ivory. Ivory is there na? Elephant uh, that is ivory. So, goods made up of ivory is an example of prohibited goods that cannot be imported. Then second, nuclear reactors. So, cannot be imported without a license that is called as restricted. Restricted goods means you can import it but that requires a license that is known as restricted. Then freely importable means you can import it without any license. Freely importable does not mean no need to pay customs duty. This is not about customs duty. Here freely importable means you do not need a license to import. Then reserved for state trading enterprises. There are some articles which you cannot directly import. You need to import through state trading enterprises like if you want to import any petrol related products, petroleum products you can import through IOC or ONGC. If you are importing any food related products, you can import only through Food Corporation of India. If you want to import any metals, etc., so it can be imported through MMTC, Multi Metal Trading Corporation. So, these are some state trading enterprises, through them only we can import. So, that is how imports are classified. Same way, exports are classified into three, that is prohibited, restricted and freely exportable. So, means some goods cannot be exported at all, that is known as prohibited. Then restricted, goods can be exported, but that requires a license, that is authorization, that is restricted. Freely exportable means the goods can be exported without any license, that is known as freely exportable. So, what is this license means? License means authorization. So, this authorization will be given by DGFT through its regional authorities and authorization is not a right, means DGFT or regional authority may refuse to grant or renew. For example, you are making an application for authorization. When you are making application for authorization, they may not give the authorization or they may ren like refuse to renew the authorization if you are going for extension. So, authorization is not a right. Then restricted goods are subject to actual user condition. Actual user condition means what? The one who is importing the goods can only use those goods that is known as actual user condition. Then every person who is importing or exporting should get a import export code. This import export code will be a 10 digit permanent account number of the entity. So, nothing but 10 digit permanent account number only will be considered as import export code. Then what are the principles for the purpose of mentioning some goods as prohibited goods or restricted goods? So, why they will specify? some goods as restricted goods or prohibited goods in order to safeguard India's external financial position. For example, certain luxury cars and electric cars are mentioned as you know restricted. Why? Because these luxury cars lot of outflow will be there, foreign exchange outflow. So, in order to safeguard India's external financial position, they may not allow certain goods to be freely imported. They may restrict those goods. Then on export of foodstuff or other essential products for preventing or relieving shortages. 
So, already we had a scarce supply of some food material like paddy, wheat, etc. Now, they may restrict export of these goods because end of the day, people in India cannot die out of starvation. So, due to that reason, they may restrict these goods to be exported for preventing serious injury to the domestic industry. So, there is a domestic industry with respect to manufacture of those goods and then so, to protect the domestic industry also, some goods may be specified as restricted or prohibited. Then on import or export for application of standards or regulations. For example, not all articles from China, Korea and all is allowed to be imported. So, like uh, if you see, so in this Instagram and all, you will see lot of gadgets that these Chinese people are using for washing, for cutting vegetables, everything they use lot of gadgets. So, these gadgets and all not allowed to be imported, not everything, because there are some gadgets which may not meet these standards, so for which it may be prohibited or restricted, so for application of standards. Then on import of fisheries for enforcement of government measures, because India is exporting fisheries, so then on import of fisheries they may regulate it. Then to a imports to promote establishment of any particular industry. Why electric vehicles are restricted in India? Because India wanted to focus on manufacture of electric vehicles. That is the reason why they are not giving permission for Tesla or some other electric cars to be imported. Because India has got huge lithium resources in Jammu and Kashmir. So, they want to use this lithium resources and make batteries. So, which means, so future they are looking at making electric vehicles in India. So, therefore, they may restrict import of that electric vehicles. That is to promote establishment of any industry or for protection of human, animal or plant life. That is, you know, in the name of some goods, if virus and all come into India and if we eat that food, sir, and if we turn into zombies and if we kill each other, then it will be risk. So, that is why for protection of human, animal or plant life. Then import or export of gold and silver. So, then again it can be regulated. Then for the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. So, there are already some natural resources. So, which are like to preserve that exhaustive natural resources, they may restrict export or for India's obligation under UN Charter. So, India will sign a contract or agreement with the UN that these goods we will not import, these goods we will not export. So, like that, because of that. Or for protection of countries' essential security interest. So, for example, arms, AK-47, MI-6 rifles, these are all not allowed to be imported. Why? If it is allowed to be imported, then our country also will turn out to be like Africa. So, wherein every person will be carrying one weapon and going, okay. So, to protect the country's essential security interest. So, these are the principles why they will restrict imports or exports, understood? Now, this is an area which is not yet tested, but actually it is an amendment for May 22 exam. May 22 they did not ask, November 22 also they did not ask. There is a chance of asking a theory question on this. What are the principles? for the purpose of restricting the goods or prohibiting the goods. Any five points you need to write, okay. That is why with examples I have discussed this. Then next, uh, in case of import of second hand goods, import of second hand goods, we have restriction. That is, if you are importing second hand capital goods and what are those second hand capital goods? Computers, laptops, air conditioners, diesel generator sets and photocopiers it is restricted. Even though when you are importing it in new form, it may not be restricted, but when you are importing it as second hand, it will be restricted because these goods will emit lot of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons that spoil the environment. That is the reason why import of these goods in second hand requires an authorization. What are those five capital goods? Computers, laptops, air conditioners, diesel generator sets and photocopiers. Other capital goods, we do not have any restriction, freely it can be imported. And other goods, other than capital goods, so restricted that requires authorization. Then generally, waste and scrap is always restricted. Waste and scrap, because in the name of waste and scrap, some medical waste or e-waste should not come into India. That is the reason why waste and scrap is generally restricted. However, if that waste and scrap is sold by SCZ to DTA, 
generally when you are buying from SCZ, it will be treated as deemed import. So, but generally import of waste and scrap requires license authorization. But when you are purchasing it from SCZ, even though it is deemed import, but that do not require any license. Then import of goods, including capital goods used in projects abroad for at least one year requires any license? No, not require any authorization. Without an authorization, we can import those goods. Say we set up a project there, one power project or some uh, project we have set up where abroad and we purchase some capital goods there used in that project. Now we are relocating that project from abroad to India. In that case, we can bring all those goods without any authorization. Then import or export of gifts. So you are importing, like you are getting a gift from abroad. Say for example, so like, uh, you know, now because of internet, so being accessible everywhere, so that uh, you started chatting with one person abroad and uh, that person fell in love with you. So therefore that person is sending one gift to you from abroad and that gift is a restricted article. But how will you know what product will be coming as a gift then it will not be called as gift. You understood or not? Gift means I will not know what product it will be. So therefore you are getting one article which is generally a restricted article but you got it as a gift. Then in that case if it is restricted articles so we don't need a license. Generally restricted articles requires license. But here you don't know what article is coming. So just a customs clearance permit is required. Suppose if you are getting a gift which is a greeting card etc and all. Then that is not restricted goods. So customs clearance permit not required. Hope you understood what I said. So that is you are getting a gift. That gift contains an article which is restricted article. No need of license but a customs clearance permit required. You are getting a product as gift, but that gift is containing an article which is not restricted, then customs clearance permit not required. Customs clearance permit is just a document which we submit with the customs department that this article I am getting as a gift for my personal purpose. So therefore, you do not have to execute any license there. Then in case of export of gifts, when you are sending the gift, you know which article you are sending. So therefore, if it is restricted goods, get a authorization. If it is other than restricted goods, no need of any authorization. If the value is up to 5 lakhs in a year and if the value is beyond 5 lakhs a year, then authorization required because government wanted to know who that playboy is because you are sending an article more than 5 lakhs in a year as gift means what kind of a human being you are and why 5 lakhs, more than 5 lakhs worth of articles you are sending as gift means how many people you would have corrected. So for that reason they wanted to know and that's why authorization is required. That is this. Then next, import of samples. Import of samples, vegetable seeds, bees and new drugs, authorization required because in the form of vegetable seeds, bees and new drugs. So they will be bringing something called as virus into India. So this vegetable seeds will contain some virus okay or this vegetable seeds will be genetically modified and that seed if you put into the earth a plant will come. That plant will give leaf and that leaves are actually drugs, cocaine etc we can make out of that. So that is the reason why authorization required. Then so some bees are imported. So these bees are genetically modified. If the bees bite you, so then you will turn out into zombie. So that is the reason why. So that bees and all when you are importing, authorization required. You understood or not? So too many movies I am watching you would understand. So then <laughs> T up to 2000 rupees CIF, authorization not required. So actually we are exporting tea. So, but if you import tea up to 2000 rupees because we import tea to understand what kind of tea that they need and accordingly we can make it and export, okay. So, therefore, we are importing some samples of tea up to 2000 rupees, authorization not required. Same way, samples up to 3 lakh rupees can be imported without payment of customs duty. Then in case of export of samples, if it is freely exportable goods, no restriction. If it is samples of restricted goods, then also no authorization but an application to DGFT. Then these are some small small points you can read it.
okay this point number 7 to point number 12 just one time you read it then various export promotion schemes so what we have seen so far is basic policy then we have export incentives so export incentives total we have advanced authorization and duty free import authorization this is for procurement of raw material without payment of customs duty this is one incentive then second we have epcg this epcg is for import of capital goods without any customs duty so that is an incentive so then we have number 3 merchandise export from india scheme is omitted and in that place we have rodtep scheme rebate of duties and taxes on exported products then the next incentive is status holder under ftp so upon export performance when you achieve you will be given a status holder depending upon the status holder you will be getting certain benefits then next one will be export promotion zone schemes that is eou ehtp stp and btp what are the various incentives to them then next deemed exports so in case of certain transactions which are deemed as exports then what are the benefits so these are the various incentives now we will analyze it one by one first one is what <coughs> advance authorization duty free import authorization next one is what epcg epcg means export promotion capital goods scheme so i am just giving you the overview of the incentives first so advance authorization duty free import authorization what is the purpose of that authorization to import the raw material without payment of customs duty then epcg epcg full form export promotion capital goods scheme that is for import of capital goods without payment of customs duty okay then we have something called as rodtep rebate of duties taxes on exported products when you are you are exporting some goods a percentage of fob you will get as an incentive that is rodtep then we have status holder incentives that is depending upon export performance you will be given a star status so depending upon the star status you will be given some benefits that is status holder incentives and next we have eou ehtp stp and btp eou is export oriented unit ehtp is electronic hardware technology park stp is software technology park and btp is biotechnology park for them what are the incentives then finally deemed exports some transactions which are considered as deemed exports for that what are the incentives now take advance authorization duty free import authorization so <coughs> these two authorizations are for what for the purpose of procurement of inputs without payment of customs duty if you are getting advance authorization can you transfer that authorization to any other person no you cannot transfer that authorization to any other person but dfia you can transfer to any other person so if you have advance authorization what duties you are exempted from so look into duties that are exempted in case if you are having advance authorization all customs duties including igst and compensation says is also exempted so this date is 31 3 2023 it has been extended up to march so 31 3 2023 so change this to 31 3 2023 so therefore under advance authorization if you have advance authorization you can import goods without payment of any customs duty including igst gst compensation says safeguard duty anti-dumping duty anti-subject duty everything but if you have duty free import authorization what duties are exempted only basic customs duty is exempted so which license is better ar dfia aa is better but the disadvantage with aa is that advance authorization is subject to actual user condition which means you cannot transfer that license but dfia duty free import authorization so can be transferred once the obligation is completed now which is better dfia is better because we can transfer we can sell the license so like this we need to evaluate which license is better and accordingly we can choose between a and dfia then what is the minimum export obligation means if you are importing something 
your export value should be 15 percent more than the import value in case of advanced authorization if you are importing tea then your export should be 50 percent more than the import so that much is the value addition value addition means export value should be more than that 15 percent or 50 percent of the import value but under dfia what is the minimum value addition for all goods it will be 20 percent then period of fulfillment of export obligation means within how many years or months we need to fulfill this export obligation 18 months from the date of issue of authorization if it is aa if it is dfia 12 months from the date of filing of application for gem and jewelry sector for jewelry sector so advance authorization is applicable but dfia is not applicable fixation of standard input output norms so standard input output norms means for every <coughs> unit of output how much of the input is required is known as input output norms so for aa standard input output norms may not be there even then advance authorization will be given but for dfia only when you have standard input output norms then only a dfia license will be given then when advance authorization will be available advance authorization is issued on pre export basis or post export basis that is first you import first you import without payment of duty use it in manufacture of finished goods then you export that is known as pre export basis first you export how much of the quantity you used in export that much you can import without payment of customs duty so irrespective of your export if you are importing without payment of customs duty that is pre export depending upon your export quantity once you export means use the local material and pay customs duty on import material export the finished goods in that finished goods how much of the raw material you have used that much you can import which is useful for subsequent export so then that is known as post export basis so advance authorization can be given on pre export basis or post export basis but dfia will be given only on post export basis means first you import the material pay customs duty use it in manufacture of finished goods you export the finished goods how much of material used in that export that much material you can again import without payment of customs duty that is post export basis then value addition value addition means already i told you so your fob value of export should be more than 15 percent or 50 percent or 20 percent of the cif value of import for example your cif value of import is 1 lakh how much should be your fob value of export if the value addition is 50 percent how much should be your fob value of export 1 lakh 50 thousand like that okay so value addition will be calculated based on a minus b by b so fob value of export minus cif value of import divided by cif value of import into 100 suppose if free of cost material is supplied by the importer outside india then you need to include that material notional cost of that material in both cif value of import as well as fob value of export for computing the value addition then next we have epcg scheme export promotion capital goods scheme like how aa and dfia is for import of raw material without payment of customs duty same way epcg also import of capital goods without payment of customs duty now export promotion capital goods scheme permits exporters to procure capital goods at zero customs duty in return the exporter is under an obligation to fulfill the export obligation exemption with respect to igst and gst compensations is also available then capital goods can be imported for what purpose pre-production production and post-production and what is the export obligation so imported capital goods without payment of customs duty how much you need to achieve as export obligation how much ever duty that you have saved on capital goods multiplied with six so six times the duty saved on capital goods you need to achieve as export obligation this is specific export obligation you can see next page <coughs> you have two types of export obligation specific export obligation and average export obligation specific export obligation means so your export should be six times the duty saved for example 
on import of capital goods you save 50 lakhs then 50 lakhs into 6 times that will be 300 lakhs you need to export and in how many years you need to export 300 lakhs worth of goods in a period of 6 years and in that 6 years also first block of 4 years you need to export 50 percent means 150 lakhs in the next block of 2 years you need to export the balance not only this you should also maintain an average export obligation average export obligation means every year export should be at least the average of the preceding 3 years which means for example so average of the preceding 3 years is 30 lakhs means this year the export should be minimum 30 lakhs that is the meaning of maintaining the average it's like in cricket so you have a target target is so 205 runs you need to take so then you need to achieve the 205 runs that is specific export obligation and you need to maintain the run rate also that is average export obligation you understood so means in one year more export another year less export not allowed consistently we need to export that is average export obligation then suppose if I meet specific export obligation but not average export obligation then in that case I will not get the benefit if I already claim the benefit that should be returned validity of authorization authorization shall be valid for import for 18 months from the date of issue of authorization means when I should import the capital goods within 18 months then other conditions so import of capital goods shall be subject to actual user condition means not so only those person who is importing the capital goods should use that capital goods and they cannot transfer that capital goods till the completion of export obligation but once the export obligation is completed capital goods can be sold or transferred then second hand capital goods are ineligible under this scheme only new capital goods you should import both physical exports as well as specified deemed export will be counted for export obligation then next uh, in case you are achieving 75 percent of the specific export obligation and maintaining average export obligation in three years then remaining 25 percent no need to achieve so actually we need to achieve six times the duty saved but out of that say for example 300 lakhs we need to achieve in that 300 lakhs 300 into 75 percent 225 lakhs we have already achieved in 3 years plus we maintain the average for 3 years now remaining amount 25 percent that is 75 lakhs we do not have to achieve that is this then under this scheme the capital goods are imported on full payment of applicable duties in cash and this this point is not applicable here so this later basic customs duty paid on capital goods is remitted that is so first we need to pay how this scheme will work actually advance authorization is like you can import without payment of customs duty but epcg how it will work first pay the customs duty after payment of customs duty then you will get the refund of that customs duty that is the meaning of this but in case of aa and dfia don't need to pay the customs duty at all but here pay and prove that you have completed the export obligation get the refund indigenous sourcing of capital goods and benefit to domestic supplier as deemed export so in case of aa dfia and epcg in all these three cases not only you are required to import without payment of custom duty even locally also you can procure without payment of gst then we have meis scheme previously that meis and seis is now omitted which is not there merchandise export from India scheme and service export from India scheme instead we have RODTEP scheme that is rebate of duties and taxes on exported product what is that that is depending upon your exported goods a percentage of your export you will get as a duty credit and that duty credit will be given in electronic duty credit ledger and the balance in electronic duty credit ledger can be used for payment of what only basic customs duty and so how it will be given a percentage of FOB value you will get as a incentive what you need to do is that so you should ensure that you are bringing the proceeds export proceeds within the time limit under FEMA what is the time limit under FEMA 9 months from the date of export otherwise 
whatever rebate that has been granted under this scheme will be recovered and will be recovered from whom will be recovered from transferor or transferee transferor that's an amendment that is suppose if i got the benefit and i need to realize the proceeds within the time limit under fema now that license that is that scheme that benefit under duty credit ledger already we discussed in 51b either the importer can use it for payment of basic custom duty or the balance in duty credit ledger can be transferred say i transferred it to you now i could not realize the proceeds within the time limit under fema now in that case so that wrongly claimed benefit will be recovered from transferor or transferee it will be recovered from transferor if sale proceeds not realized within the time limit under fema then the rebate granted shall be recovered from the person to whom the rebate is granted even if such duty credit is transferred to any person then ineligible categories so in this case we will not get rodtep benefit first export of imported goods why because <coughs> first of all rodtep scheme benefit is given to you because you have paid some local taxes and duties other than gst so there could be some local taxes like state taxes municipal tax or professional tax or some local body tax etc for that now when you are importing the goods and exporting where from you paid the local taxes on those goods so you will not get rodtp benefit same way exports through transshipment so that is you are importing from one country and exporting to another country that is transshipment again there is no local taxes on those goods again i am repeating rodtep benefit is given because you manufacture some goods in india and those goods will have some local taxes and to give you the relief of that local taxes they give this incentive but when you are importing the goods which are exported or importing goods exported through transshipment where are you manufacturing those goods in india so there is no manufacture in india means low, no local taxes in india that's why you will not get rodtep then export goods subject to minimum export price or export duty or restricted goods and prohibited goods are deemed exports and supply of products manufactured by dta to scz or ftz because we have not actually exported we just sold it to scz then products manufactured by 100% eou or customs bonded warehouse again these goods are manufactured in eou bonded warehouse means so these are imported goods we are not locally manufacturing it on this eou and bonded warehouse there is no local taxes then products manufactured or exported in discharge of export obligation under aa dfia in case of aa dfia already you got the incentive then again you will not get incentive under rodtep so this you have to by heart no other go you need to remember this because in exam they will be giving so some cases and in those cases which case you will get rodtep benefit like that they will coin one question so now we need to take out these ineligible categories and other exports we need to see total exports and the notified rate will be given in the question that rate should be multiplied on these exports and you need to get how much is the benefit you will get under rodtep then next uh, status holder under ftp status holders means depending upon your export performance you will be given a star status if you are achieving a export performance of 3 million dollars you will be given one star status if you are achieving 25 million dollars export performance two star like that 3 25 100 500 2000 you need to remember this 3 25 100 500 2000 you will get this star status then this export performance should be counted for one year or more than one year that is while counting this export performance it is not one year exports it is actually four years exports that is we need to take current year and previous three years so current year and previous three years taken together if it is 3 million dollars then you will get one star status current year and previous 3 years taken together if it is 25 million dollars you will get two star status and how many times you need to achieve this 3 million dollars 25 million dollars two times in a block of 4 years just to one time if you achieve this you will not get so two times you need to achieve means so in a block of 4 years 
two times your export performance should be like uh, 2 million dollars then you will get the one star status and while counting this 2 million dollars whether we take one year exports no first year and the prece preceding three years so will be taken for example we have uh, 2017 2018 19 20 21 22 like that now here we have got so 2 million dollars 2 million dollars and then here we got 5 million dollars here we got 15 million dollars here we got 20 million dollars here we got 100 million dollars here we have got so 150 million dollars now this is for every year now how to count the export performance for 2017 export performance will be current year and preceding 3 years so we do not have this is the first year so 2 million dollars 2018 5 plus 2 7 so 2019 current year plus previous 3 years so 15 plus 5 20 22 then 2020 current year plus preceding 3 years so 20 plus 15 35 plus 5 40 42 and then current year plus preceding 3 years 100 plus 20 plus 15 135 so plus 5 140 dollars then again 2022 current year plus preceding 3 years 150 plus 100 250 so plus 20 270 so 285 dollars now this is the export performance now so first year and second year you got more than 2 million dollars so how much it should be 3 million dollars so 3 million dollars when are you getting consecutively two times 2019 so 2017 2 million dollars ignore 2018 7 million dollars is it more than 3 million dollars yes 2019 also more than 3 million dollars yes so you will get one star status in 2019 then when are you excluding 25 million dollars in 2020 first time in 2021 second time so therefore in 2021 you will get two star status again <coughs> to get three star status you should achieve 100 million dollars so 2022 is 285 2021 is 140 so more than 100 dollars two times so therefore three star status you will get in 2022 understood or not this is how we need to compute then what are the benefits to the status holders authorization and customs clearances on self declaration basis they don't need any certificate from a officer and fixation of input output norms on priority within 60 days and they don't have to furnish the bank guarantee then two star export house and above that is except one star they can establish their own warehouses licensed warehouses and green channel clearance for above three star above three star means four star and five star green channel clearance then physical examination of goods is not there and all these all these people can self certify that the goods are made in india then this point is not applicable at present so no need to study that so this is about you know the status holder under ftp then export promotion zone schemes what are considered as export promotion zones eou ehtp stp and btp are considered as export promotion zones and what business they can do they can do any business other than trading other than trading they can do any business in this and they need to achieve a positive nfe what is positive nfe means income in forex minus expenditure in forex they need to achieve in a period of 5 years suppose if they are not able to achieve in a period of 5 years that 5 year period can be extended by 1 year what are the benefits that they will get they can import goods without payment of customs duty including igst and on import of services whatever gst they pay under rcm they can take it as itc and they can get it as a refund then next uh, whenever they are procuring goods locally so they can procure the goods without payment of any gst then whenever they are making supply to a recipient normally they will pay gst and whenever they are exporting goods or services that will be treated as zero rated means export without payment of customs duty or gst and they will get the refund of itc so these are the various incentives that they have next uh, conversion of dta into eou suppose if you are having a business in dta and if you want to convert it into eou so you should have an investment of at least 50 crores 
in plant and machinery are your turnover should be at least 50 crores. Either your investment should be at least 50 crores or turnover should be 50 crores. Then suppose if you want to establish a new EOU, then there is a minimum investment criteria of 1 crore. Then any goods which are manufactured in EOU can be cleared to DTA. So, but certain quantities can only be cleared. Then exit from EOU scheme. So, whenever you want to come out of the EOU scheme, you can exit from the EOU scheme upon payment of the incentives, whatever you have enjoyed. Then deemed exports. What are considered as deemed exports? So, total we have 6 deemed exports concentrate. Sale to advance authorization holder. You are an advance authorization holder. I am selling some goods to you. For me, it is deemed export. So, you are advance authorization holder means what? You are actually exporter. You got an advance authorization because you are importing goods without payment of customs duty for export. Now, you can either import without payment of customs duty or locally procure goods without payment of GST. So, whenever I am selling goods to you, for me, it is deemed export. Same way, you are a EPCG holder. I am selling the capital goods to you. For me, it is deemed export. So, sale of goods to advance authorization holder, sale of goods to a EPCG holder, sale of goods to EOU. So, which will be treated as deemed export. First three. What are the first three? Sale of goods to AA, sale of goods to D EPCG, sale of goods to EOU. Then, three projects. Three projects. International competitive bidding projects. There are some international competitive bidding projects or nuclear power projects or projects under UN or international organization. To those three projects, if I am supplying goods, then it will be treated as deemed exports. What are they? Goods sold to international competitive bidding projects, goods sold to nuclear power projects, goods sold to you know UN or international projects, then also it will be deemed exports. So, these are the six deemed exports. In case of these six deemed exports, what are the benefits? I am selling it to you, I can import without payment of customs duty, that is one benefit. Or I can import upon payment of customs duty, when I am selling it to you, I will get the refund of customs duty, refund of export duty drawback, understood or not? Just like duty drawback, import goods, pay customs duty, upon export you will get duty drawback, na? like that. I will import goods without payment of custom duty, that is one option or I will import goods upon payment of customs duty when I am selling it to you, so then I will get the refund of customs duty. So, these are the various incentives that we have and any breach of these, you have to pay penalties under GST and Customs Act.